but she wasn't quite sure which cat was missing. It's hard to count cats in an overstuffed mobile home, especially when they won't hold still. After several failed attempts, Gertrude realized that all she had to do was write down the cat's names as she spotted them. She grabbed some scrap paper out of one of her scrap paper bins. First of the roll call was Sunshine, who was napping atop a pile of linens, which were on top of a, a box of light bulbs, which was on top of two twin-sized mattresses leaning against the wall. <laughs> Gertrude has a lot of stuff in her trailer. Next was Rain. Gertrude caught him strolling down one of the narrow paths carved out between stacks of her belongings, and knelt to give him a soothing neck scratch. She wrote his name down and then, gr and then grunted as she stood up to head toward the bedroom, which was where Blizzard liked to hang out. In this manner, eventually, Gertrude deduced that Tornado was the missing cat. She weaved all over her trailer calling his name, but there was no Tornado. He must have gotten out somehow, she said to Hale, who seemed to agree. At least he didn't argue. So Gertrude put on a sweatshirt. It was September, so not quite jacket weather in Maine yet, and then she and her walker headed out into the trailer park. <clears throat> Gertrude lived in trailer number three. Her park consisted of 12 trailers located on either side of a narrow drive. Each end of the one-way road spilled out onto Route 150 in the small town of Mattawooptock, Maine. Oh, no, I did not. Mattawooptock. Gertrude started at the trailer to her right. She knew its residents weren't home right now, which was good as she wasn't really in the mood for human contact. She bent over and looked under the trailer as she called Tornado's name. Then she walked around the trailer looking for any signs of a wayward feline. She found none, so she moved on to the next trailer. She knew that Old Man Crow, that's what the neighborhood kids called him, was home. He was always home, and she could hear his TV. She thought about knocking on the door and asking him if he'd seen Tornado, but he was an ornery old coot and she didn't want to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Old Man Crow was all fancy and had skirt panels around the bottom of his trailer, so Gertrude couldn't see underneath. He also had curtains, so she couldn't see inside, so she moved on. She reasoned that the next trailer would be empty too. Its new residents had moved in a few months ago. Gertrude had seen a woman and two kids and had assumed the woman was a single mother. She looked under the trailer and called a tornado. Then she took a stroll around trailer number nine, alternately calling and listening. As she came around to the front again, she thought she heard a meow. She froze and held her breath. There it was again. She bent over and looked under the trailer. Nothing. She stood and waited. And there it was. The cry for help was muffled, but she knew that voice anywhere. It was Tornado, and he was inside the trailer. Gertrude took three steps close to the door. Tornado? <laughs> nothing. She took another step closer. Tornado? She waited. Still nothing. She climbed the steps and stood in front of the door, leaning forward so her face was only inches from the door. Tornado, are you there? She heard a squeak and a burst of adrenaline shot through her. She pounded on the door. Hello, hello, is anyone home? Nothing. She pounded again. Nothing. She looked around the trailer park to see if anyone was watching her. She saw no one, so she reached for the door now. It was locked. What on earth, Gertrude thought? No one locks their house in Mattawoop Talk. She put her lips as close to the door as they could get without actually touching the door and yelled, Don't worry, Tornado, I will get you out. I'm going to call the fire department again. <laughs> as Gertrude stood waiting for the cat to answer, the door opened, and Gertrude found herself eye to eye with a little boy. A little boy who was holding her cat. Please don't, ma'am, the boy said. Don't call me ma'am. I'm not old. And that's my cat. Oh. Okay, so we're going to fast forward. So she finds this cat, but as she goes into the trailer, she finds out that their mother is missing. And that's why they don't want her to call the fire department, because then the cops will know that they're there alone, and they're, they're scared. They're two little kids. It's a little boy and his sister. So Gertrude, for some reason, decides to help. That seems out of character. But she decides to help. So we're going to fast forward. Um, Gertrude finds out that their mom, she snoops around the trailer, and she learns that their mom uh, has done some shady stuff, and she works at a bar. Okay. So there is a man in town named G, and G is a pastor, so Gertrude knows that G will help her. So she talks G into going to a place where she thinks the woman might be. All right. G pulled into the empty parking lot of Water Whoop Park in Water. Mata Whoop Talk. <laughs> okay. That's the first time I've ever said that out loud. <laughs> I, 
don't think he lives here, Gertrude. The place looks deserted. Gertrude put her hand on the door handle. Would you mind waiting for a few minutes? G looked at her incredulously. Gertrude, there's no one here. I know, I'm just going to have a look around. G looked through the windshield at the tall wooden fence that encircled the water park. It's a closed building and a closed fence. I don't think there's much to see. I know, can you help me out? G sighed, but he got out of the truck and walked around it to place the milk crate by her feet. He helped her out and then watched her walk toward the door. She pulled on the door handle. It was locked. Satisfied, G asked from behind, still standing by his truck. Gertrude looked up. Can you feel the top of the door frame, G? He came up and stood beside her and then looked down at her skeptically. You mean feel for a key? What else would I want you to feel for? <laughs> <laughs> this is a business, Gertrude. He's not going to leave a key, even if this is Madame Wu Talk. Would you please just do it, or I will get my crate so I can do it. G sighed again and half-heartedly reached up and felt the top of the frame. Then he held up his empty hand. See, nothing. Gertrude stepped back and surveyed the scene in front of her. G waited patiently for a minute and then asked, can we please go? There, Gertrude triumphed, pointing at a rock, pressing up against the building several feet from the door. There what? There. It's a rock. What rock, G said. There were so many rocks. <laughs> that one, Gertrude said without pointing. It's different from the others. G stared at the rocks and the base of the building. I don't see it. Gertrude heaved a frustrated sigh and took two steps toward the rock and pointed with her chin. That one. So I guess you're expecting me to pick that rock up. She waited. He walked over to the building and bent to retrieve the rock. Not that one, Gertrude said exasperated. That one. G picked up a different rock. This one isn't a rock. I know. Flip it over. He did. I'll be darned. There was a small compartment in the bottom of the false rock. He opened it and removed a key. Gimme, Gertrude said, holding her hand up toward it. <laughs> oh, uh, I wrote this a long time ago. Sometimes I laugh at my own jokes. No, G pulled it away from her eager clutch. What are you going to do with it? What do you think I would do with a key? G frowned. You want to tell me we're breaking into a water park? We're not breaking in, G. We have the key. <laughs> Gertrude, you said you had to talk to Silas. He's obviously not here, so let's go. The man probably has a telephone, you know. Fine, Gertrude snapped. Why don't you just leave? I can walk home. G laughed. Gertrude never walked anywhere, let alone the five miles home. That would wear the tennis balls right off the bottom of her walker. I'm not leaving you here, G said, but I need you to tell me what we're doing. We're just going to take a look around, make sure Silas isn't here. If he was here, wouldn't he have come to the door by now? Not if he can't. G furrowed his brow. Is something wrong with Silas? I don't know. You won't give me the key. <laughs> Looking exasperated, she walked to the door and unlocked it. Then, holding it open with one hand, he waved Gertrude in with the other. Ladies first. Let's hope there's no alarm system. <laughs> yeah, right. Who would break into this place? Gertrude asked. <laughs> and she looked at the dark fire. She immediately groped around the adjacent wall for a light switch. <laughs> Hang on. I've got a flashlight on my phone, she said. Ooh, fancy. Her fingers found the switch. No need for one of those fancy doohickeys. You're probably right, G said, following her inside. If you had a cell phone, I'd probably have to go on a lot more of these errands. Oh, stop it. You know you like feeling needed. G didn't respond. At least I'm not asking you to babysit my cats again. <gasps> What's that? What, G asked. That! The house of balls. Um, it's a house of balls, G said. I can see that. I can read. But what is a house of balls? Gertrude was downright excited. It's just a big box full of balls for kids to play in. <laughs> oh, goody! <clears throat> Gertrude ran over to the ladder. Gertrude, don't get in there. I might not be able to get you out. G hurried after, but she was already on the ladder. Then she froze. <gasps> oh, my Lanta! What? G asked, but then followed her gaze and jumped. There was a woman in the house of balls, and she ap appeared to be very dead. As Gertrude stared, Gertrude, no, excuse me. As G stared, Gertrude jumped into the house of balls. I got really excited because she was about to jump in. <laughs> I read ahead. Gertrude jumped into the house of balls. Gertrude, no! Gertrude landed and instantly sank to her shins. She tried to pick up one short leg, but then the other leg sank and she toppled over sideways with a small yelp. She flailed her arms looking absurdly like a chubby Raggedy Ann doll. And then she sat up with a giant smile on her face this is great! <laughs> okay, sadly, she has found the mom, and the mom is not okay. So, Gertrude.
Richard does some investigating, and she finds out that a woman that this mom worked with is not a nice woman. So Gertrude thinks that this woman, Trixie, has killed the mom. Oh my gosh, I'm getting depressed, oh. right? Mm -hmm. But Gertrude is going to go after Trixie, because that makes sense. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so here we go. Oh, I forgot. So Old Man Crow, his first name is Calvin. And in the pages that I didn't read, she gets Calvin to help her, because Pastor G is just done. He's like, so she gets a cranky old man to help her. Oh, God. Yeah, right? <laughs> Calvin pulled the car back out into the street and drove in the direction that Trixie had walked. She's just come out of the bar. They caught sight of her just in time to see her turn right down a side street. Calvin groaned. Where on earth is she going? Gertrude wondered aloud. I think I know, and I don't want any part of it. What? Where is she going? This is Frank Street. Frank's Street, not Frank Street. Oh, no, Frank the Cop? Yes, Frank the Cop. <laughs> The house where Frank the cop lives with his wife? Gertrude asked. Yep. Let's go! It's not a dead end, is it? He pulled the car over. No, it's not, but Gertrude, I just don't want to do this anymore. If she's going to a cop's house, she's obviously going to be safe. Unless the cop is the murderer, too. I thought you said the mayor was the murderer. <laughs> well, we don't really know that yet, do we? Gertrude really doesn't like the mayor. <laughs> Okay, well, I know that Frank the cop is not a murderer, so I'm going home. If you want to get out, do it here. Seriously? You're going to abandon me in the middle of town in the middle of the night? Well, I'd rather you just go home like a normal person, and I would be happy to give you a ride. But if you're going to insist on following this stripper around in the dark, yes, I'm going to leave you here. Fine, Gertrude said in a huff. She climbed out of the car and slammed the door. Then she opened the back door, made a big show of wrestling her walker out of the back seat, and then slammed that door to you. And then without so much as a glance, she walked away from Calvin in his car. Skipping ahead a little bit to something funny. She tried to hold her chin high as she stomped off indignantly. She heard Calvin pull the car away from the curb and was overcome with a sudden realization that she was alone, in the dark, on a strange street, with nothing but a walker, a walkie-talkie, and a jitterbug she wasn't quite sure how to make a call with. She calls herself on a jitterbug. I don't know why she does these things. Well, if I get into trouble, I'll just call Calvin with the walkie-talkie. He might come back. Gertrude took a deep breath and headed down the street. It took her a while to reach the greenhouse, and she was huffing and puffing by the end of her walk. When she finally reached her destination, there was a cop car parked out front. <coughs> so this is the right place. But Trixie was nowhere in sight. Gertrude spotted a nearby bush that was just about her size, so she walked over to it without the intention of crouching behind it. Then she decided that was far too much work, so she plopped right down on her fanny. There, that's better. She relaxed for a second, and then she peered through the bush at the house, and she saw nothing. It was a house. Its porch light was on, and it cast a weak light over the porch and most of the front yard. She stared at it, trying to see anything of interest, but there was nothing. Fine, I'll just sit here. If someone is getting murdered, I'll hear it. She began to relax, and then a light came on in the upstairs room. A second later, two figures appeared. One was definitely a female. She decided it must be Trixie. And one was probably a male. The cop? Maybe. She couldn't stand not knowing. She decided to creep closer. The front porch's light did not reach the side of the house where this upstairs window was located. So she was able to walk through the house under the cover of utter darkness. When she reached the house, she realized there was lattice work covering most of the wall. And that lattice work was covered with the red leaves of autumn vine. What a stroke of luck, she thought. She surveyed the wall. Then she slipped her shiny new phone into her pocket just in case there was anything through the window worth photographing. She took a deep breath and reached up with her left hand to slip her short fingers through the holes in the lattice work. Once she had a good grip, she slipped off her left loafer and poked around the bottom of the lattice work with her foot until she found a foothold. Then she gingerly pulled up with her left hand and pushed up with her left foot until her weight was supported completely by the wall. Her body was fully suspended, a full six inches off the ground. <laughs> well, I'll be darn tootin' in hell. She took another deep breath and then, pushing with her left foot, she reached as high as she could with her right arm and quickly stove her stubby fingers into the vine, trying like mad to hang on to the spot where her hand had landed. She was able to. Then, scared to death of falling, she swung her right foot around in an absolute panic, trying to find purchase. 
Finally she did, and then she clung to the lattice work with all four limbs trying to catch her breath. After about two minutes of rest, she gathered the courage and strength necessary to reach upward again with her left hand. And in this way, Gertrude managed to slowly climb up the wall toward the second story window. After 15 minutes of climbing, Gertrude was a whopping three feet off the ground. <laughs> her right foot slipped. She cried out, sounding a lot like a wounded duck, and flailed her foot around trying to find another place to stick it, but it was no use. <laughs> Suddenly, both her hands began to slip from their grip, and then she was falling. She screamed like an exceptionally loud rabbit caught in a trap, and then thud. Gertrude landed in the grass, her limbs all akimbo, her breath knocked completely out of her. In seconds, she heard footsteps approaching, and absurdly thought it was Calvin coming to rescue her. But then she realized she was standing, not standing, staring, the barrel of a gun. What on earth is wrong with you, Trixie asked, glaring down at her. Gertrude tried to roll over, but she looked much like a chubby beetle stuck on its back. Aren't you cold? Gertrude asked. Trixie was only wearing underwear. Gertrude reached into her pocket and tried to be sneaky as she stabbed at the smartphone screen, but Trixie took one quick step and then kicked the phone out of Gertrude's hand. Ow! You really think I'm going to let you call for help? No one is coming for you. You're going to die just because you were stubborn and stupid. Now get up. Gertrude tried to roll over, but couldn't. Trixie laughed. Frank's not going to rescue you either. You didn't think I heard you when you started climbing the vines? You sounded like a herd of elephants. I told Frank... <laughs> I told Frank that it was just a fat cat, but I had a feeling it was you. So I tied Frank to the bed. What, are you going to kill him too? Of course not, Trixie cried. I'm not going to kill Frank. I love him. I did all of this for him. I just had to tie him up so I could deal with you, you crazy wench. Now get up. Oh. I can't. Can't you see I'm disabled? You're going to have to help me. I'm not. I'm not touching you. Get up. Gertrude could tell she was getting worried. Poor little Trixie doesn't know what to do. Why did you kill Lori? None of your business. I'll get up if you tell me. You'll get up now or I'll shoot you in the head. No, you won't. Calvin is parked at the end of the street, she lied. He knows I'm here. He'll call the cops. Trixie looked at the end of the street. Then she looked at Gertrude. Get up. Then I'll tell you whatever you want to know. It hurt, but Gertrude managed to get herself rolled on her side. Then painstakingly she rolled on her belly. Then she did half a push-up cried out in anguish, and collapsed. Oh, oh, you stupid freak. Trixie reached down and tried to grab <laughs> Trixie reached down and tried to grab Gertrude's arm, and Gertrude swung one chubby leg in Trixie's feet. This knocked Trixie off balance, and she let go of Gertrude's arm to catch herself with her free hand. Then, with all her gumption, Gertrude used the same leg to kick, kick at the gun, which went off in Trixie's hand, momentarily freezing Gertrude with fear. But she soon realized she wasn't in any more pain than usual, so she figured she hadn't been shot. <laughs> on all fours, she scrambled toward Trixie, fully intent on scratching her eyes out. Oh my, you crazy old hag, you're nuts! Trixie punched Gertrude in the face. Gertrude's head snapped back for the blow, and she put her left hand to her cheek in surprise. Ow! That hurt! Gertrude reared up on her knees and tried to hit her back with her right hand, but missed. She flopped back down on the ground. Will you just stop? Trixie cried out of breath. Gertrude did stop. She was too tired. She rolled over on her back and looked up at Trixie. Oh, just tell me why you did it. I'm going to die anyway. Throw me a bone. Because I love him, and Lauren wouldn't stop blackmailing him. I didn't mean to fall in love with him. I just did. And she didn't care. He told me to. A cop told you to murder a waitress? Gertrude asked, appalled. No, you idiot. Frank told me I had to get her to stop blackmailing him. Then he would leave his wife for me. Gertrude started to laugh then. A great deep belly laugh burbled out from deep within her and burst onto the scene, echoing through the neighborhood. Shut up, Trixie hissed. You just shut up. You are bonkers. He wasn't going to leave his wife. You killed her for nothing, you idiot. I didn't kill her. Her greed did. I tried to warn her to scare her off, left her death threats at work, but she wouldn't stop. So I told her that I was meeting Silas again at the water park. Said she could come for more pictures. Then we could threaten his business as well as his marriage. Oh, did she find the hide key too? What? No, I climbed through the window. Oh, you should have just used the key. It would have been easier. The women heard sirens. Trixie looked up. Then she took off running into the neighbor's backyard in her underpants with the gun. <laughs> Gertrude knew that it wasn't the cops. Gertrude knew that it was only an ambulance, but apparently Trixie didn't know her sirens. 
Gertrude lay there trying to catch her breath as the sirens got closer and louder. Then the ambulance pulled into the driveway and its headlights lit up her spot on the lawn, which was not quite trampled. She lifted one weary floppy arm in the air just so they could see her. They must have as she soon heard their footsteps running across the ground. Are you the one who pressed a life rescue button? Gertrude turned her head to the side and saw some bright orange New Balance tennis shoes. They were the most beautiful shoes she'd ever seen. <laughs> yes, she said, but I'm okay, I think. I just fell while scaling that wall. But you should call the police because there's a cop upstairs and he's tied to the bed and there's a murderer. She went that way. She's in her skivvies and she has a gun. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.